Welcome or welcome back, I'm Kelsey, and in this video we are actually going to be breaking out my watercolor palette. I haven't used watercolors in probably two or three years, it's been a long time. And today we're going to be working on this study of this absolutely fantastic Monet painting. It's from his Water Lilies series. Monet is really famous for these, but this one in particular is in a private collection, so it's not seen by the public very often, I actually just stumbled across it very recently, like a few days before I started this painting. It just really struck me by all the color that's in there, like the pink, purpley kind of water lilies really drew my attention again and again while I was searching for a subject for this for this study. So I think the painting turns out really great in the end. I use watercolors, as I said, but also we dabble in gouache a little bit and then we go with some colored pencils and eventually oil pastels. So it's very much a mixed media kind of experience, which isn't something that I normally do. So I wanted to branch out a little bit and experiment because as you guys know this about me, I love experimenting. Experimenting is, I think, one of the best things that you can do with your artistic practice if you're prone to burnout and like sort of feeling very stagnant in your art. I find that when I'm feeling really burnt out, one of the best things that I can do for myself is either to take a break or to try something really different. I'm trying to make something that I feel really excited about again. And this painting was definitely one of those things for me, but also it was nice to be able to complete something in mostly one sitting which is a very stark contrast to the oil painting that we worked on last week and that I am still working on because it's just like one of those pieces that's requiring a lot of layers. So in this painting, I start out doing just this really quick little color pencil sketch and then we go right in with the watercolors. I use watercolors for a very solid percentage of this workflow and all of my watercolors in this palette, they were handpicked by me. It's not like a store-bought palette or anything. I had to select all these watercolors by hand. So it took me a long time to build this palette up. Before I was into acrylics, I was kind of a watercolor fanatic. I did a lot of stuff with watercolor and I really gravitate more toward the watercolors that have like special effects that kind of like granulate as they dry. So a lot of these are Daniel Smith. A few others though are either Windsor and Newton and a fair fraction are actually handmade pigments that I got off of Etsy. So lots of Etsy stores will sell really unique paints and I like to always try new things. I don't know. I'm sort of one of those people that like, I just like totally fall for the new shiny, funky art material kind of thing. Purpley sort of bluish color that you see me put in these water lilies, that's actually lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli is one of the most expensive pigments that you can that you can buy, really. And I managed to get this watercolor tube. It was a tiny little tube that I squeezed into this pan and I got it for a steal. And the color is like so, it's so transparent and it behaves so uniquely that I just, I don't know, I really have a lot of fun with it. So I like to break it out whenever I can when I use watercolors. And it was nice to, to get back into this way of working because it's so different from oils. When you paint in watercolors, a lot of it is just these overlapping transparent layers. And you have to be really careful when you're painting over an old layer because re-wetting the paint is very easy and you can scrub off the pigment to reveal the white of the paper underneath. So it's not like oils where everything dries down completely and it's, you know, you can't re-wet it or anything, you can't reactivate it. It's, um, it definitely requires a little bit more forethought than I'm used to. And so you can sort of see me throughout this whole process struggle a little bit with um, the way of working that watercolor and gouache and oil pastel require. I do think though that a consequence of my lack of familiarity with watercolor as of late sort of translated into this painting, losing a little bit of the life that it had early on in these initial layers as we go toward the end. I think knowing what I know now, like sort of rediscovering my knowledge of watercolor, I think I would be able to far more successfully pull off this painting if I were to do it again. But I did have a lot of fun doing it. I found it really rewarding and refreshing and interesting to have to force myself to let go a little bit of the control that I have over the process and sort of let the paint do its thing, especially because I have 
all of these really unique pigments. I don't have a lot of watercolors in this palette that dry normally. A lot of them are all special effects pigments. It was really a unique experience. One of the things that I love about the reference photo, the original Monet painting, is all of the colors that you can find in this painting. I mean, like, seriously, you have every shade of the rainbow in here if you look close enough. And there's just something about the way the light reflects on the watercolors and sort of the slow realization that you have that you're looking at this incredibly interesting body of water that these water lilies are resting on and that there's like foliage being reflected in this water that I find really compelling. Monet talks about in his writing how most of what he's interested in his art, most of what he was interested in in his artwork was the interplay between color and light. And I think that's at the core, of course, of the Impressionist movement and something that I find myself really personally compelled by today in my own work. A lot of what I was doing in the beginning was sort of setting the tone for the whole painting. So of course, with watercolors, you have to paint from light to dark. So the lightest part of the painting has to be really transparent layers because the paint, of course, isn't opaque, it's transparent. So that's why I was blocking in those water lilies first and then adding in the darks like just kind of around now, especially sort of the little outlines between these water lilies. And if you paid attention to the composition of the original, you'll notice that I did deviate a little bit in terms of like the placement of the water lilies that wasn't actually on purpose. <laughs> I was just sort of like following what I felt was right and it sort of ended up being like this. So I think it looks great either way. Um, I do think the original is of course better, like it's Monet, you know, I'm not gonna beat Monet um, in like a few hours, but it's definitely, it was definitely a learning experience and I really enjoyed getting up close and personal and sort of having this learning experience one-on-one -on -one with a Monet painting and sort of figuring out how he would have constructed this and what colors he used, what techniques. I think there's a lot, a lot to be gained by doing master copies or studies of famous works of art like this because you really do get this understanding of painting that's hard to get anywhere else. Of course, there's, you know, a discussion to be had about whether um, you should do this all the time. I think it's good as like a learning exercise. Of course, I wouldn't do this for an artist that I considered my peer, you know, like that's, that's copying. That's not really doing a study in the same way. For famous works of art like this, I think it's generally accepted that this is totally fine. And I think in fact, it's a great learning experience for beginner or intermediate artists such as myself when you're trying to gain these skills and this understanding of color theory and composition and mark making. My experience with this painting it was just really fun. Um, it was, of course, like I had to troubleshoot some parts along the way. Like there's this atmospheric effect that Monet is able to create with the lighting, particularly on like the left, like the top middle left hand side of the painting. And then like the purplish sort of fade into the background that's on the water lilies on the right side of the painting. That was hard for me to achieve with watercolors, especially because I didn't really fully think it through. Going back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of like the me struggling with having to adapt my normal oil painting techniques to the watercolor. Learning from this painting was really, really interesting. And it's definitely something that I would consider redoing doing in oils if I have the chance. As you guys know, I moved into this new apartment in New York City. It's an enormous apartment. We have 12 foot high ceilings and everything's just like very white right now. Um, and we don't have a lot of furniture yet. Everything is super backed up. We're not gonna get our couch until like October, which is crazy. It's been a struggle for me to think about what to do with the walls because it's just like, there's just so much space. And whenever I look at our apartment, it still feels like I don't know, someone else could live here because it's like not personalized yet. So over time, as I, you know, collect more unique things for this space and Drake and I get like some art and some, you know, things to put up on the wall, I think it'll start feeling more like home. But for right now, I don't know, the walls kind of, they loom over me. And one of the things that I'm kind of concerned about with decorating and furnishing the apartment is not taking full advantage of the sheer vertical height of the space. 
and I don't want the results to feel like all of our furniture is so low to the ground that it feels like I don't know like a dollhouse or something I'm, I'm not sure how to like really correctly visualize this but like imagine like, you have a 12 foot ceiling and your couch only you know and the whole living room every single thing in the living room never like passes like three feet in height that would just I don't know it would feel really jarring right like you're not taking full advantage of the space it doesn't feel um, correct. So one of the things that you guys will absolutely see me do over the course of the next few weeks and months is to create some more art and like sort of DIY pro DIY projects for for this apartment, like sort of for myself, doing more personal work. And it might seem like, you know, of course, Kelsey, all of the art that you make is personal work, but I think in quite a few cases, I'm picking subjects to push my abilities further and sort of the aesthetics of it kind of come secondary to that. So I like to really pick subjects, especially lately, that are a challenge for me, that help push me forward. And the aesthetic consideration of like, would I want this on my wall is something that comes sort of secondary to the consideration of like, is this going to help me develop my skill set? I think especially because a lot of the colors that I've gravitated to in the past have been relatively cool toned and the fact that like a lot of the decor in this apartment that we're collecting and stuff is really warm like a lot of like rusts and like mustard yellows yellow is my favorite color actually and I sort of seldom use it in my art except for that house painting that I posted last week but yeah, so I think a lot of what I want to do over the next few weeks and months is sort of making more personal art for myself, like sort of doing really big projects that push me further, of course, but also like I'm excited to create and hang up in my house and I'm not really like incentivized to sell. I talked about this in a recent video, but I am actually intending to launch my online shop in like October or November once I get a little bit more settled and I have sort of a solid body of work that's relatively recent that I'm proud of. I want to start selling prints and some originals and um, yeah, I think that's something that I'm definitely building towards, you know, working towards a little by little by little, but uh, yeah, I guess I'm just like, I don't know, I'm really excited <laughs> uh, to have this new workspace that I'll be showing off next week in my studio tour and makeover video, and I just think, like, there's so much potential here, and I'm so excited to finally have an apartment of our own that I'm, you know, of course, living with Drake and sharing this apartment with him and everything. And as a couple, that's really exciting to finally have our own space. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's exciting. A lot of the mindset, the mindset that I've had over the past several years has been one of like, I'm living here temporarily. I shouldn't, you know, put down too many roots or like get too comfortable because I'm leaving soon. And this apartment and like moving in and everything really is sort of a different a different mindset for me right now because i'm allowing myself to sort of blossom in this space decorate it how i want because i know that like you know we're probably going to be living here for it like you know of course at least one year probably maybe two or three and i think that's really exciting um and i'm looking forward to making a lot of art for this apartment and as we continue to work on this painting I'm really trying to add in those details and I'm kind of fighting with myself a little bit. Like I keep having second doubts over the direction that I'm taking the painting. I'm like sort of looking at the original and thinking like this isn't quite compare, this isn't quite the same and trying to shift my perfectly fine interpretation to something closer to the original and getting kind of lost in the process. So if you're gonna take my advice and work on some master copies or studies of famous works of art of your own, I would really suggest that at a certain point, like stop looking at the reference. Um, just take what you have, keep going, follow it in a direction that feels natural for you, and then intermittently look at the reference photo, like see what you can take from it to further enhance your own version, but don't be afraid to deviate a little bit. Um, I think, you know, there's something of course to trying to recreate a painting like stroke by stroke, that's really technically complicated. Um, like there's a lot of skill involved there, but you might even get more out of it if you allow yourself to interpret things a little bit more. So, now we're going into gouache. Um, I really had a problem with these water lilies trying to get them to be the nice sort of light color that I wanted them to be. So 
I end up going in with this gouache and I'm using a combination of Holbein, M. Graham, and Arteza gouache actually. I love Arteza's hot pink gouache color. I'm not sure if you can buy them individually. You might only be able to you might only be able to get it in a set, but I really love that hot pink color. I find it really useful for things like this. I also have a similar hot pink in oils that I'm in love with, which is Holbein's Duowakwa Luminous Opera color, which is fantastic. But yeah, so we're going with gouache, and gouache gives this piece a nice kind of illustrator sort of vibe. It brings it beyond an oil painting, and it becomes a little bit more... Um, Disney-like or something? I don't know. Gouache is really this really specific vibe for me that really reminds me of vintage illustration and like sort of all of that flat color that you find in early Disney work and advertising. I think there's definitely a time and place for it and I don't often find myself reaching for it, though I used to, particularly because like for me, I really struggle with using gouache in the painterly way that I'm really accustomed to and so I often bring it out for flat washes like this where I want like a specific sort of solid color and I'm adding accents to something that already has like a lot of variation in it. So I really enjoyed using gouache for this portion. I found that it was pretty easy to get lots of different colors in these water lilies and really sort of make them a little bit sharper, a little bit more saturated, a little bit more toward the direction of what I think the original looks like. And I also use gouache to add in some warmth back to the painting with the sort of with this sort of like red iron oxide and yellow ochre color that I kind of pepper throughout the whole thing. And then I actually also add some very, very bright yellow. That sort of brings me back to my earlier discussion that I mentioned about how this painting is really mixed media because it, it 100% is. But I also wonder if, if I had paid closer attention to the colors and the variation in color in the beginning with the watercolor stages, if I would have been able to skip this step and actually really have a better appreciation for the beauty of watercolors. I think if I had done a yellow wash in the beginning for most of the background, I probably would have been able to skip this step and saved myself a lot of frustration over the painting not quite looking like what I was seeing in the reference. And then we're peeling this tape. I actually use masking tape. Um, it's like, it's supposed to be good painter's tape, but it tore this paper quite a lot. And I was, I don't know, really frustrated with that because I always hate it when you tape, you tape a painting down and you're working on it for a few hours and then you peel the tape off and it like exposes the paper pulp and you get like tears and rips and stuff and it's really annoying. Um, yeah, I'm probably not gonna be able to sell this as an original, but I will probably release prints of this eventually once I launch my online shop. So yeah, that was the end of the first session. I left this to dry overnight, and then the next morning I started going in with colored pencil and oil pastel. So what you're seeing me do right now is sort of adhere. So what you're seeing me do right now is clip the painting down to just like the watercolor pad that I had at the time. And then I'm picking out some colored pencils, bringing out my oil pastels, and adding in some finer details and more texture to this piece. A lot of what I love about Lee Ellickson's work, for example, is how much texture she brings into her work. She like does these ink washes and then gouache and then like Posca pens and like wax pastels, colored pencils and ink. And she isn't afraid to layer tons of different mediums and really like explore what kind of surface you can have in a piece. And I wanted to sort of channel that energy a little bit and really go all in trying to have lots of different bits of texture, lots of different really interesting areas in this painting so that when you looked at it, you didn't want to look away instantly. It sort of, I wanted it to kind of draw you in and have you be able to see lots of interesting areas peppered throughout the piece that had some really interesting texture stuff going on. So I go in with colored pencil and I lighten up some of those water lilies again and I use the orange colored pencils, all Prismacolors, to add in some more of those yellow tones that I think the original watercolor piece was missing that I found in the oil painting and then I actually even make all of this even more yellow and more high contrasty when I bring in those oil pastels. So 
Oil pastels are a very new medium for me. I was thinking about making a whole video just devoted to oil pastels when I first got these Sennelier oil, oil when I first got these Sennelier oil pastels a few months ago, but I ended up hating the piece that I did with them, so I actually didn't end up publishing that video. But yeah, now I'm sort of using them along with my cray paws and I don't know, just sort of messing around, having a good time. I think the cray paws are much firmer and the Sennelier's, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, they're like butter in your fingers. I mean, they like, they waste away so quickly. They leave such fat marks that are so easily blendable with your fingers. Um, it was really hard. It was really complicated for me to do a piece using just oil pastels when I tried to a few months ago, but I think they work much better in a context like this where you have all of this color already laid out by watercolors and gouache and, and colored pencils, and then you can just sort of go in using oil pastels as like a finishing touch to just bring in a little bit of kind of like extra stuff uh, and just sort of have a good time with all of the different textures and like, I don't know, like blendability that you can have. And I think the blendability of the Sennelier's and the Cray Paws really, really helped this piece feel like it was more watery. Um, I think that's something that the Monet painting has a lot of that my original watercolor kind of lost a little bit. So I was glad to bring that in with a little bit of sharper detail while still having that like streakiness that's in the original. And one thing that was kind of hard for me to actually really effectively render was the water lilies. I know that I've talked about them a lot and said that I like them, but there's like this creamy pinky color that I really wanted to have in oil pastels that I didn't and it's not like you can really blend them super well like to have a coherent like kind of flat color so I ended up having to settle for like this white and red kind of combo um, and I think it ended up being not quite as saturated or as varied as the original is so that's something to keep in mind I think oil pastels are definitely something that you want to make sure that you have all the colors for and now we're really just adding in those finishing touches, making it, I don't know, even better. I love the dark details that I added in at the very end over here, really like bringing up the contrast in this piece. And it's just, it's filled with color. A lot of my work isn't like this colorful while still being this cohesive. And so it was really interesting for me to be able to play with this Monet painting and learn a lot about how he, used color and light and mark making to really lend itself to really make these gorgeous works of art. So I hope you enjoyed this video and hear me sort of ramble on about this painting. If you liked it, feel free to comment below and subscribe. And if you want to see even more of my work and even more behind the scenes content, consider checking out my Patreon. And with that, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye guys.